Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is the grandson of one of the greatest cinematic legends of all time, Joan Crawford. In 1947, seven years after adopting her children, Christina and Christopher, Miss Crawford adopted twin daughters, Kathy and Cindy. Our guest is the son of Kathy Crawford Lalonde, who sadly passed away on January 10th, 2020. Although our guest was only five years old when his superstar grandmother, whom he affectionately called Jojo, passed away, he has many fond memories of his time spent at her home in New York. And he's dedicated a great deal of his time and energy in preserving, celebrating, and honoring her incredible body of work and legacy. Joan Crawford made 89 movies, including some of my all time favorites Grand Hotel, The Women. A Woman's Face, Humoresque, Flamingo Road, Sudden Fear, Autumn Leaves, Possessed, The Damn Don't Cry, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and of course, Mildred Pierce, for which she won an Academy Award. She also appeared in dozens of TV shows, including General Electric Theater, Della, The Lucy Show, and Night Gallery. Joan Crawford rose from a youth of dire poverty and literally reinvented herself, first into a dancer in the Roaring Twenties, then into a silent screen star, and then into a full-fledged screen goddess. She was known for her phenomenal work ethic and perfectionism, as well as her incredible devotion to her fans. After her death in 1977, her eldest daughter, Christina, published a book entitled Mommy Dearest, claiming that Joan was physically and emotionally abusive to herself and her brother, Christopher. The book, which was made into a movie starring Faye Dunaway, was hugely controversial and was immediately denounced by many of Miss Crawford's friends and co-workers, as well as by her daughters, Kathy and Cindy. Although to be fair, some celebrities, including Helen Hayes, June Allison, and director Vincent Sherman, while never witnessing any abuse, did describe Miss Crawford as an unusually strict parent. Whatever may be the case, the book and movie had the unfortunate effect of somewhat overshadowing and tarnishing Joan Crawford's well-deserved place as one of the golden age of Hollywood's most important and prolific leading ladies. Her handprints and footprints are in the forecourt at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. She was awarded the Cecil B. DeMille Award at the 1970 Golden Globes, and the American Film Institute named her the 10th greatest female movie star of all time. The efforts of our guest to shine a light on Miss Crawford's talent and artistic legacy are greatly appreciated by her legions of fans, including myself. I'm delighted to welcome Casey Lalonde to our show. Casey, thank you so much for being here. Harvey, it's a pleasure to be here. And that introduction was fantastic. Thank you so much. You've laid out just the, the history and the iconic nature of my grandmother, Joan Crawford. Thank you so much for, for having me today. It's my pleasure. Casey, I know you were only five years old when your grandmother died, but can you share any moments, any memories you have of the time you spent with her? Certainly. I, I was young, but we... We lived about two hours. My family lived just north of Allentown, PA. We would jump on Route 22 for anybody familiar with the area and drive into New York City. We would spend afternoons with her uh, in her apartment, her last apartment at Imperial House. She would babysit us. My parents would go out to lunch, go shopping. And she was, she never, she, as you said, she did not like to be called a grandma. So her nickname for us was JoJo for my my entire life to this day, she would babysit us in the afternoon. She would be just like anybody's grandmother, taking care of us, playing with us, allowing us to be children, except she was Hollywood legend Joan Crawford. Do you have any photos of yourself with your grandmother? I don't. That's one of the saddest things about my history with her. She was in declining health when I was, when I was young. She was suffering from pancreatic cancer. She did not uh, like her picture to be taken. There's an infamous photo that kind of, with Roz Russell, she and, and Roz appeared at a, a charity or a party, and there was this, I would call it her last public photo taken. She did not like the way she looked because she was always a perfectionist about 
presenting herself to the public through her decades of, of, of uh, working with at MGM and Warner's. So she did not like the way she looked and she kind of then began, began to seclude herself in her Manhattan apartment. She still had friends over, she still had gatherings, but she was not the outward public person. After spending decades in front of the camera, in front of crowds, in front of fans, she became a secluded person. She did not want her photo taken. So that, that's one of the, the missing pieces of, of my life with her. There's been so much written about Joan's obsession with cleanliness and tidiness. And in her book, My Way of Life, yes. there was a certain rigidity and formality in the way she wanted things done. Mm -hmm. I know you're not a psychologist, but what do you make of that, Casey? Yeah, I've, I've formed some opinions over the years. I direct that thought directly to her childhood. The whole mommy dearest wire hangers thing, her cleanliness, as she's famous for changing the toilet seats after every husband uh, leaves the home, that kind of thing. I believe she was probably a bit OCD and her obsessiveness about cleanliness, I believe came directly from her very, very difficult, very hard childhood of being a child of a single mom for most of the time, having to work as a child uh, way before anybody should have to go to work and support the family. So I direct that thought directly back to her, her childhood and forming her, her perfectionism, not only cleaning up the house, but in her career. She always made it a point to be extremely friendly, knowledgeable about her crew, the director, her co-stars. She was a perfectionist. She knew everybody's lines. She showed up before time for, for, for call for, for her shots. So I think that perfectionism just really came from her childhood, in my opinion. Yes, in her childhood, she worked in a laundry and she was quoted many times as saying, I can't get the smell of that laundry off of me. Yeah, that is indicative of, if you want to call it PTSD, I'm not sure, but she definitely had those, I, I would almost go to horrific childhood experiences of having to work in a, in a, in a, hot, steamy laundry doing other people's cleaning. And it just left an indelible mark on her just for, for her, her entire life. Now, obviously your mom and your aunt Cindy must have told you a lot about your grandmother. Do you think she was happy with the career she had? I think she was happy to a point. She had just an incredible career at MGM to start, was unceremoniously essentially fired from MGM and moved to Warner's. Once she got to Warner's, she had just incredible success with Mildred Pierce Humoresque, Possessed, and then moved into Flamingo Road in that time period of her life in the 50s. She met and married Al Steele with PepsiCo in 55. So that gave her yet another focus. She became a Pepsi ambassador. During her marriage to Al Steele, she traveled the world. My mother uh, and Aunt Cindy went on those trips to Europe and I think just throughout her career, focusing on her family was paramount, but she also had to pay the bills, especially after Al Steele passed away. He left her with incredible debt. So she worked until she had to, to pay off those debts, support her own family. And again, she was, you have to think about this. She was a single mom for most of her life of, of four children. And she had to pro provide for them. Philip Terry was just a short time, their marriage when they had Christopher, and then Christina, and Al Steele was later. So my mother, Kathy, and my Aunt Cindy were young teens when Al Steele came into the picture in 55 so through 59. So it was a dual focus of her life to take care of her family, maybe the way that, she, not maybe, the way that she was not taken care of by her mom. They were provided for. My mother and Aunt Cindy have... I have never experienced any, any recollection of any ill talk about my grandmother from my mother, especially she was, she called her loving, supportive, never one to shy away from giving her advice and just a supportive parent overall. Again, a, a, a completely different attitude than Joan grew up with, with her mother and her, her, her lifestyle back then. Now, you've mentioned the fact that when you came along, Joan was already in her, really her final years. And there's been a lot written about those years. She was often described as a recluse. 
From what you've been told, do you think she was a happy person in her later years? I think the saddest part about the, her later years was the conflict between her wanting to be a perfectionist with her physical appeal and just not being able to measure up to her idea of what Joan Crawford, who she was, given that perfectionism in her life and in, in her mind, she could not portray that perfect image of Joan Crawford from 1925 through late 60s. She always tried to portray herself that way. And there's, of course, the Hollywood thing of aging actresses kind of get written off after a time. So she could not portray that young, vibrant Joan Crawford anymore. Even the Mildred Pierce era or even Baby Jane in 62, she just could not pull it off anymore in her own mind. So she did not want to portray that to her fans in public in later years. That's why she became more of a recluse. When did you, Casey, begin to develop an appreciation for her as an actress? That's a great question. I, of course, knew she was, I knew her as, as JoJo. Even at five, I knew she was someone important, but I didn't, obviously at that age, I had no idea. When I started to really appreciate her as an actress and a person was in, in, the, in the intervening years, I was six, seven, eight, nine, we'd start watching her movies. And Mildred Pierce played frequently. Baby Jane played frequently. Her portrayal of the blind woman in Night Gallery, who ultra rich, directed by Steven Spielberg, that is an episode of television that brought me to understand that she was an icon, Hollywood royalty. Again, as the years progressed, we had more access to her, her library of films. TCM comes along in 95, 96, and opens the floodgates to almost her entire library of of films, most of which I have I had never seen. We come from the, the television era to the video cassette era to now digital. And you can see just about every single film she's ever done. And I think I've seen, except a couple of lost silence, uh, most of her films. So I really in my late single years to my teenage years became just really knowledgeable about her, her career and brought me such joy that I was part of this royal family of, of a Hollywood icon. Now, other than a few brief statements to interviewers over the years, neither your mother nor your Aunt Cindy ever made themselves publicly available to try to restore your grandmother's public image and preserve her legacy. What made you decide to do it? When Mommy Dearest was published, you can imagine the wedge that was driven between the, 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 in the family. It really all started the day, and this is from my mom, the day the will was read was an atomic explosion in the family. Christopher and Christina were famously written out and that led to Christina then publishing Mommy Dearest. And then the film comes out. I actually withdrew myself. As a, as a young person, I didn't want to hear the, the wire hanger jokes anymore. For my, the rest of my high school years, into college, into my early adulthood, I got married. I would be extremely selective who I told who my grandmother was. I didn't want to hear the bad jokes. I didn't want to hear the off-color questions, the abuse questions, everything else. But in about 2005, I was, throughout my entire life, I was in, in touch with Betty Barker, who was my grandmother's personal secretary for decades. I called her Aunt Betty. She was a lovely woman. I went to go see her about 2004, 2003 in LA. I had not been to LA for, since 1999, I think. I reconnected with Betty and I decided to, I was old enough to take on the mantle of preserving my family's history. I felt mature enough to do it. And one other thing that has really helped me reach out to audiences is I have the Joan Crawford Home Movie Collection, which is at the at George Eastman House Museum in Rochester. 
It's about two, two and a half hours of home video, well, video home films that she took over, over the decades. Uh, and Joan was famous for throwing everything out. She purged like she was a pro. She didn't keep anything that was even slightly unsentimental to her. She purged everything. But these films were so important to her because they showed her family, showed her life, that I now use that as, as a redirection away from the whole Mommy Dearest thing to really personalize and show fans that there's more to her than just Mommy Dearest. There's the, her, her films, and these home movies really give a personalized look at her life. Well, Casey, I'm gonna tell you something. I am very glad you decided to go public because it was about time that Joan's family stepped up to restore her reputation. But on a personal level, Casey, mm -hmm. has there been a therapeutic benefit to you in your life of doing what you're doing on behalf of your grandmother? There is. I feel as though I'm protecting her legacy. I'm protecting my mother's legacy. Uh, and you said she, she did pass about two years ago, right before COVID hit. It's my daily mission to reach out to fans. I give talks all over the country. COVID has really put a, a damper on the public things I do. I've been to TCM Film Festival. I've been on the cruise. Uh, in March, I'm going to the Secaucus Public Library to show, I think we're going to show a woman's face to the library crowd. Anything I can do to help preserve and elevate my grandmother's legacy way beyond mommy dearest to go back to 1925, go back earlier in her childhood, explain things of how she came to where she came to her horrible childhood and how she became just an incredible Hollywood legend was incredibly charitable. A lot of people don't know she gave time, effort and money to charities every single day of her life including her last will and testament, which gave 90 plus percent of her remaining cash to varied charities. So that just shows even another side of her, which a lot of fans don't know, that she was one of the most charitable, charitable people in Hollywood over her entire career. So for me, it's always therapeutic to be able to be proud of my family and elevate her, her, her personality and, and career to another level. And I'm proud of you for doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you Do so you much. have a favorite Joan Crawford movie? I can't name one, but I do. I have to go back to Mildred Pierce, of course. She won her Oscar. Anytime Mildred Pierce is on TCM and I happen to be home, I can't not sit down and watch it. I will stop everything and watch the film. But there are so many others I love. A Woman's Face, Baby Jane, of course. It's just a gothic horror film, which, and her purported feud with Betty Davis is right there on screen. I do like her early, early films too, though. The, the first possessed paid just to see her in, in as a, a 27, 28 year old grand hotel with, with the Barrymores, Wallace Beery, Greta Garbo. She is up against some of the most incredible actors and actresses in Hollywood history. And she steals the film right out from under them. It's just incredible. Here's another one. Johnny Guitar, they just did a 4K restoration a couple of years ago, I think. The vibrancy, forget, forget the storyline for a second, the vibrancy of the colors. I actually have snapshots, and I'm hoping to publish them at some point, of her time on set with Johnny Guitar. The photos, Kodachrome photos are just incredible. The storyline in Johnny Guitar, Nicholas Ray's direction is incredible, but the what would you call it, a feminist Western? I mean, it's the two lead characters, Mercedes McCambridge, and they hated each other on screen and off, really just make it just a fun ride throughout. Yeah, it really it, is. It really is. It, I, I also loved the women. The women is fabulous. Not a single man in, in, in sight. And her role, she's almost to, almost to the point of evil in it, the way she connives her way through steals Norman Shearer's husband and then goes after another uh, another woman's husband on screen. She is almost evil. It is just fabulous, a fabulous movie and a great, uh, just incredible ensemble cast. Is there a movie role that she played that in your opinion most closely resembles her real personality? I'd have to go back to Mildred Pierce. And there's such the Vita, Christina correlation, if you will. 
I, I Mildred starts out certainly not poor, but having to bake pies to make ends meet. A little bit of a hard life. The, uh, Bruce Bennett, wonderful actor, leaves her in the film. Doesn't show up again for 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 an hour in the film. So Joan is left. Mildred is left as a single mom raising two kids. Tragedy occurs. She focuses then on Vita, and think the the wheels fly off of the relationship. Obviously melodramatic, but I think the way she portrayed her, her role as Mildred, really was personal to her. The way way it was portrayed. Well, many people who knew her, including director Vincent Sherman, said that her performance in Queen Bee most closely resembled the real Joan Crawford. I find that rather upsetting. What do you think? I think that's hyperbolic, to say the least. I think he may have just seen a side of her that no one else saw, perhaps, and they, they, they did have a relationship. I think I've, I've watched Queen Bee a dozen times. I think that's just a little, a little overboard. Queen Bee, was, uh, she was evil in that film, of course. But I think that's a little, a little overboard. Who has the Academy Award that Joan won for Mildred Pierce? I don't know. My mom sold the, the Oscar back in 1994, and it's been resold. There's no, no trail whatsoever. And it's my life's work to somehow get the Oscar back. I'm not sure how that's going to happen. I want the Oscar back. Well, how do you feel, Casey, about your mother selling such an important memento from your grandmother's career? We had words about it, of course. I thought there were other things we could do. I was at college. I had no idea what was going on at the time with that. And I, that's another thing I, I feel like a part of our history is gone. I wish it would have been returned to the academy or, or some other public place, but it didn't happen. So I'm always on the lookout for news about its whereabouts. And that would, that's another one of my life's goals is to somehow get the Oscar back and donate it to the Academy. Who has the Cecil B. DeMille Award that Joan was given at the 1970 Golden Globes? That was sold in 2011. I don't know. It's never come back up for auction to my knowledge. And I don't know who owns it. I was slightly outbid for it. I wish I'd known you back then because I would have helped you bid for it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Are there any of Joan's personal possessions that you've inherited that are particularly meaningful to you? I have, I have, I do have a number of her possessions. Again, she was the master of purging. So the things she left, she had left at the end of her life were incredibly important to her. I have three items that really speak to me that I've had in my adult life. She was incredible friends with William Haynes, who was an actor in, in she was a colleague, uh, he was a colleague of her at MGM. He was famously turned out of the industry because he was gay. He would not give up his relationship with Jimmy Shields. Jimmy and, and Billy Haynes stayed together as a couple till his death. I have two Billy Haynes designed chairs that are in my living room that I've, I've had as an adult for years. They can be seen in publicity photos of Joan back in the 30s when they were designed by Billy Haynes in her living room. So the, those two chairs, of course, I don't, they're decoration only. I don't touch them except to move them around. We certainly don't sit on them. Those are incredible links to me, not only to my grandmother, because I remember playing under the chairs as a child, but also the connection to Billy Haynes and his incredible story of Hollywood and his relationship with his partner, Jimmy Shields for, for decades. The second item, I have her backgammon table. I do not play backgammon. I've always wanted to learn. It's, for, it's decorative, it's beautiful. That's in my living room as well. Because as growing up as a kid in my mother's home, after Joan died, my mother inherited all of her real property. So we had the backgammon table and the two Billy Haynes chairs slipped underneath the Backgammon table, that was my childhood. I've got those in my living room. Two great things. Here's the third. It's cute, it's tiny. Tur this is kind of funny. It's a little tiny turtle that if you touch the tail and the head, it, it rings. It's kind of a butler summoner kind of thing instead of a bell. 
that's in the living room as well. Those are the three things that just speak to me as Joan's grand grandson and just bring me back to early 70s and then throughout my childhood in my family home. I think she would love that. As you know, Joan Crawford has always had a huge gay following and her friendship with Billy Haynes is a strong indication that Joan was very supportive of the gay community, don't you think? Absolutely. Through her entire life, not only did she defend Billy Haynes, she was incredibly supportive of, and I think more quietly than she used her soft, quiet power as opposed to giving speeches and, and being very public about it. But the fact that she was friends with Billy Haynes in the 20s, and once he was ousted from the studio, she ensured that his career as an interior designer flourished. She used him frequently for her, her interior designs and also recommended to her to, to her Hollywood friends. And he, he, he decorated the homes of just everyone in, in Hollywood with that Hollywood Regency style. Yeah, I don't think that there's been enough said about Billy Haynes. This is a man who dared to be openly gay, yes. gave up a very promising movie career. Joan Crawford, by, by becoming a client, brought him so much business mm -hmm. and helped him to reinvent himself and be a success. That was amazingly ahead of her time. And I think she deserves a lot of credit for being such a good friend to someone who had become an outcast. I really do. Yeah, I mean, he, he could have remained closeted. He was a he was a incredibly handsome, engaging human being. He could have had a career for decades in Hollywood. He had to stay true to her, true to himself. And Joan was there to support him in every step of the way. They remained friends right up until the day he died corresponding frequently and we're friends forever. Since 2006, you've been answering questions from fans on the Joan Crawford website, which is at joancrawfordma.tripod.com. That must be incredibly time consuming. Yes, I've actually curtailed some of that work. I'm about to launch my own website where I intend to continue. That is one of the most fun things I can do is reach out to fans. When I'm at TCM Film Festival, when I'm at, at the Secaucus Public Library, I've, I've spoken at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, UCLA. That is the best thing is to meet per fans in person and answer their questions. Well, All I wanna fans. tell you something, Casey. I'm gonna tell you what impresses me so much about the fact that you're answering hundreds of fan questions on the website. Your grandmother was renowned for answering every single fan letter she received throughout her career. Mm -hmm. I myself have a letter from her. Fantastic. And by answering the questions submitted to you by the fans, you are carrying on her legacy. And I think she would be very happy and very proud of you. And I am too. I, I appreciate that. That's one of my intentions was to continue her legendary. She wrote over a million fan letters, responses in her life which is incredible. She hand wrote them. She was famous for using a typewriter. Betty Barker was instrumental in, in organizing all, all of the fan material, sending out photos because she knew without the fans, this is a very, such a simple thing, but it, it, it's incredibly true. Without the fans, she wouldn't have made it in Hollywood. If people didn't come to see her films, she would have, her contract would have been null and void. She took care of her fans because she knew one thing was that the fans were number one and she wanted to take care of them. What's the most unusual question you've ever been asked by a fan? Let me see. I do. I, I would get a lot of, I, I would actually get a lot of questions about her, her food preferences. She was famous for hosting dinner parties. So questions about famous dishes that she would make. Typically, the questions are very reverential, very respectful. So I, I don't recall anything off color or off key. The fans are extremely interested in her entire life, but always just incredibly, I wouldn't say innocent, but just wanting to know some details, but never going astray by any means. What did you think of the Ryan Murphy miniseries Feud? I enjoyed it. 
I, I'm in, in, in coming years, I think historians looking back may look to feud as a turning point, maybe, maybe in redirecting future fans and current fans, I wouldn't say obsession, but pretty close on Mommy Dearest. Mommy Dearest was, I've, I've spoken to thousands of fans over the years in person. Mommy Dearest was always the entry point for, for a, a lot of fans. It was famous, very controversial. I think Feud, again, maybe looked back in, in coming years as opening the door on a grand scale to the much bigger version of Joan Crawford from 1925 to her death, as opposed to just Mommy Dearest. Well, now that you've brought up Mommy Dearest, am I correct that your mother and Cindy never saw Christina again after Joan's funeral and the reading of the infamous will in 1977? That is correct. I have never met Christina. I, have, I had never met my uncle Christopher because the, the seeds of, of this family, uh, family trouble, Joan knew that Christina was writing a book. She didn't know its exact contents, but she got word that it was coming. And that's why Christopher and Christina were written out of the will. It's very clear. And from the date of the will being read from the funeral, my side of the family, meaning my mother, Aunt Cindy, we never saw them again. It was just an immediate separation, no contact, except when Christina and Christopher probated the will in New York, in New York State, depositions were, were, were taken. That was the last interaction at all, and it was adversarial. There was nothing family-like about it, absolutely. Well, in 1995, your mother launched a defamation lawsuit against Christina Crawford for claiming in an interview that your mother and Cindy were not biological sisters and that the adoption was not legal. The lawsuit was settled out of court, correct? That is correct. That stemmed entirely from Christina. I think it was Larry King interview where she claimed that my mother and Cindy were not related biologically at all. They were fraternal twins. I've met the family from which the, my mother and, and, and uh, Cindy were adopted. It's the whole infamous Georgia Tan, Tennessee children's home story, which is, which is an incredible story on its own, where Joan did adopt Cindy and Kathy, my, my mother, but they were, we have the court doc, we had the court documents. They were, they were, they were sisters. They were fraternal twins. Absolutely. I know that you never met Christina. You never met Christopher and he's passed away. I yeah. want to ask you, Casey, if you're able to answer this, mm -hmm. if you were to meet Christina, what would you say to her? I would be cordial, but I would, I would have, she, and she probably would not answer me. I would want to know the truth. I have never in my adult life called Christina a liar. She experienced what she experienced. I wasn't there. I can only go by what my Aunt Cindy and my mother told me throughout my entire life about Joan, that she was supportive, a good mother. I want to hear Christina's story from her mouth about her experiences so I can maybe reconcile those two completely different worlds that they grew up in in the same household. Well, I want to tell you something. I don't know how much you know about me. I was a family and criminal court judge for 26 years before nice. retiring and hosting this show. Mm -hmm. I saw incidents of this kind of thing many times in court where the particular chemistry between one child mm -hmm. and a parent is very different than what occurs later on with other children. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, no one except who was there will know what really happened. It is important, I think, that Christopher publicly supported Christina's allegations against their mother. I mm -hmm. think that is significant. Mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that one parent has a very difficult and conflictual relationship with one child doesn't really have anything to do with what can happen later mm -hmm. when the parent is in a different place in their life. Maybe they've learned their lessons. Maybe the relationship, the personalities of the other children are different. I just hope that everyone watching mm -hmm. understands that we'll never really know. We know what Christina says was her truth. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And I think it deserves some respect, given that there have been people in Hollywood who said they felt Joan was unusually strict. Mm -hmm. And we know that parents, the behavior they have in front of other people is Mm -hmm. different than how they treat their children when there's no one watching. I'm going to leave it at that. It doesn't affect my particular feelings because I think you can separate the art from the artist. Is that how you see it as well? I do. I do. And, and again, I rely, uh, I rely on my mother and, and, and Cindy's perspective, uh, of course. Now, Christina was nine years older than, my, than Cindy and, Kat, and my mother. So there was a definite difference in age. Anything could have happened in that time. And I, I, again, I've never attacked Christina for her views. She has her views. They are what they are. But yes, I can definitely separate my, mo- my grandmother's work from Christina's allegations. And I think the fans... The fans do as well, to a degree. Now, as you know, Betty Davis's daughter, B.D. Hyman, wrote a tell-all book about her mom while Betty Davis was still alive. And Miss Davis responded with her own book in which she included a letter to her daughter. Do you think that Joan Crawford would have responded publicly to Christina's book in some way? I do. And I, I, that's another kind of tragic thing about this whole situation with Christina. If she would have released the book prior to, to Joan's death, Joan would have responded in, in public and defended herself. Joan did not have that opportunity like Betty Davis did. Betty Davis and BD went back and forth for years over allegations. And Betty Davis does not have any reputation of being a horrible mother, whereas Joan's reputation was destroyed because there was no opportunity to respond. Well, frankly, I thought B.D. Hyman's book about Betty Davis was pretty lame. I mean, if you'd known my mother, I may tell you, I would have been very happy to have Betty Davis as a mother, although mine was pretty terrific. But eccentricity does not equal abuse. I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Now, you know, not every star chooses to respond publicly when their child writes a tell-all book. Shirley Mm -hmm. MacLaine's daughter wrote a scathing book about her mother. And so far, so far. Ms. McLean has not issued a public response. I guess we'll never know what your grandmother would have done, but why didn't your mom or your Aunt Cindy ever write a book? Interesting question. I have an, a very, a, an answer for you. My mother appeared on Good Morning America on ABC. I think I was in third grade. I believe it was after the, the film came out. The publicity generated by that interview, I wouldn't say scared my mother, but she, did, she didn't like the attention. I think she just wanted all, all the controversy just to kind of go away, and it never did. But I believe Cindy was on the TCM documentary uh, back in the 90s. But again, it wasn't as much as I would have preferred as a defense. I think both, I, I can only speak from, for my mother, but I, I think she was just trying to shy away from hoping the controversy would just kind of go away which, which I, I, I would have preferred that we hit it straight on. My mother did start a book with an author. And the, I cannot remember the author's name. I was, I was young, but it was, it was soon after Mommy Dearest came, the book came out. I recall coming home from school. My mother was in tears. And the author said he was canceling the book because the way my mom described it was it wasn't juicy enough because Joan treated my mother so well, there weren't any instances of crazy behavior, almost to kind of meet Christina's version of her, of Joan for her with Mommy Dearest. I think the author wanted to combat it with a different, maybe a different crazy, I don't know. And my mother's stories about her life with Joan were just wonderful stories. Visiting, visiting the set of baby Jane, and coming back from school and weekends with, with mom. So it just did not, I guess, meet the author's goals, I guess. And she, after that, she was done. She d- didn't want anything more to do with, any, with a book or anything else. Well, if your mother had written a book, she would have made enough money that she would not have needed to sell that Oscar from Mildred right. Pierce. That's what exactly. I think. Yep, I agree. Now, I want to, if you'll permit me, Casey, I want to say this to those of our viewers who may have difficulty with this interview, because I know I'm going to get a lot of feedback. Whatever happened way back when Christina and Christopher were children, Mm -hmm. I think it's important to separate the artist from the art. 
People do that all the time when talking about the work of Errol Flynn, Roman Polanski, Woody Allen, Michael Jackson, Bill Cosby, Kevin Spacey, and many others. So speaking for myself, as a big fan of Joan Crawford's work, I personally have no problem appreciating her as an actress without regard to whatever was going on in her personal life. No one is being forced to watch this interview, and I hope you can appreciate where I'm coming from. Now, Casey, I know this may sound weird, but in a rather ironic way, the whole Mommy Dearest thing managed to keep Joan in the public eye and actually brought her millions of new fans. There are lots of people out there who had never heard of Joan Crawford until they saw the movie. And that's what triggered their interest in learning more about her and watching her movies. Do you think that's right? Yes, absolutely. I've spoken to hundreds of fans, young, and I'm talking young people in their early 20s, even late teens, that their entry, entry gate was Mommy Dearest. Whether they saw it on TV, whatever. That was the entry point. And then all of a sudden the door opens and here's a woman with dozens of films, a history from 1925 to 1970 with the Trog, her last film, oi. So yeah, she had to pay the bills. The entry gate was Mommy Dearest. So all of those fans, I've met people who have tattoos of my grandmother on, on, on their arms who weren't alive when she was alive who just came to Joan 10, 15 years ago, but now appreciate her entire body of work. And when they turn on TCM, when they see a DVD at the library, they have this complete body of work now that they've been introduced to. So yes, ironically, maybe against Christina's wishes, Christina elevated Joan to a lifelong, lifelong place in the zeitgeist of America, around the world and introducing her to new fans. And I, I hate to, I've used this as an example, very reverentially, Norma Shearer. I love Norma Shearer. She's a great actress, but we don't hear a lot about her anymore. You hear about Joan Crawford almost every day. She's mentioned as uh, on late night TV as, as part of a joke. She's mentioned everywhere because of Christina's book and the movie. Don't you find it interesting that after Mommy Dearest, Faye Dunaway's career basically went into the toilet? It tanked. And I think that was very, uh, not even ironic, very strange. But I think Hollywood in general looked upon her role as it won Razzies, I think, that year for, for one of the worst films of the year. I think after coming out of Bonnie and Clyde, Network, all the incredible films that Faye Dunaway had done. It took years for her to get even back to a, the semblance of, of a normal career. She was the punchline of jokes, couldn't get work because she was so inextricably linked, not to my grandmother directly, but to Mommy Dearest as a, as a, as a bad film. And it's just very ironic to me, absolutely. There have been a lot of books written about Joan Crawford. If someone were looking to read the definitive biography, is there a book that you recommend? I would start with her two books, Portrait of Joan from 1962. It's in her words. It's, a, it's certainly not a basic autobiography, but that's a great place to start. I would then jump to her as a, as a, as a bookend to that and to all the books written about her. Go to My Way of Life which is just, it's her lifestyle book before lifestyle books became a thing. It is the campiest, craziest book ever. And it just shows her the way she did things. It gives an insight to her maybe OCD behavior, her perfectionism, tells you how to pack, pack for, for travel, how she, how she lived with Al Steele. It was, it's just an incredible bookend to her life. Bob Thomas's book is very good. Th there's actually not one that I would disregard. Charlotte Chandler's book was good in my opinion. I love Charlotte Chandler's book. I met her when, uh, when it was published. I love that she really focused on, on Joan's charitable work with the Hollywood home. And she recounts just an incredible, th I didn't know this. The Hollywood home in, in Woodland Hills takes care of retired 
crew and actors, both the hospital and, and, the, and the, the retirement home. As soon as Joan was making enough money, she would pay for the care of whatever actor crew member ended up in, in particular beds in the hospital completely anonymously. I just find that incredible that she would be that charitable. And it just opened up yet another angle to my grandmother's life where it's just, I just, I just find complete enjoyment knowing that she was just an incredibly charitable person and was taking care of her, her friends and colleagues in, in a time of need. There was a documentary film made about Joan called Joan Crawford, the ultimate movie star. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen it. I'm yeah. wondering, would you like to see a movie made about Joan's life? I would love to see, I would love to see a biopic done. I would almost like to see, given the, the I'm not sure two hours is gonna do it. What's your opinion? I'm not, I'm not sure that's enough time. No, I think a mini series focusing on her entire life and career would be terrific. Yes, I think a limited series like Feud, 12 episodes from her child, you have to focus on her childhood first. You have to know where she comes from all the way through her ending years. 12 episodes would be fantastic. Netflix or some other, some other streamer, absolutely. Now, Casey, there's a new Joan Crawford blend of coffee being sold online at hollywoodblends.com. Tell me about that. Sure. Maybe 18, maybe 20 months ago, I was approached by uh, Dominique Benedict. She had a startup. She loves Hollywood. She loves coffee. And she thought, what two worlds together would not be a fantastic thing? We were right in the middle of COVID. Everybody was in lockdown. She started her own coffee company focusing on Hollywood. And the first thing I say to her is, wouldn't it be fun to wake up in the morning and have a cup of coffee with Joan Crawford? And my grandmother was infamous, famous for having, in films and in personal life, for having a cup of coffee and some toast for breakfast. That was it. So to have Joan on the cover of a bag of coffee it is just, remar just remarkable to me. And Dominique did such a great job. I worked on the packaging with her. Joan's famous signature is on it. There's a little story about her on the back. And the best thing about this coffee, outside of all the Hollywood icons she has, Boris Karloff, Hedy Lamar, James Dean, Joan is now on a bag of coffee. And it's all fair trade, uh, organically grown. It's just the best coffee in the world. And you can wake up and have a cup of coffee with Joan. That's the best thing. I hope all the Joan Crawford fans out there will order some Joan Crawford coffee at hollywoodblends.com. Dominique has done an incredible job with this line of coffee. We did feature Boris Karloff's daughter, Sarah, on the show and talked about her coffee. I have both the Joan Crawford and the Boris Karloff coffee. They are wonderful, wonderful coffees. And I think everyone will really enjoy them. And it's a great gift to give to fans who may not know about the coffee uh, blend. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. gift. I want to tell our viewers that you can submit questions to Casey Lalonde about his grandmother, Joan Crawford, by going to the Joan Crawford website, joancrawfordma.tripod.com backslash ask Casey. And you can order the new Joan Crawford blend of coffee at hollywoodblends.com. Okay, Casey, you've been very patient. I've asked you a lot of questions. I only have one more question for you. Are you ready? Of course. If you could speak with your grandmother today, what would you say to her? That's a great question. I've thought about that for years. I would first tell her that I love her and I miss her. I, given as an adult, I would, of course, ask her a thousand questions, but I would tell her that she is a, she was a trailblazer, not only in Hollywood, but with her work as a Pepsi ambassador and board member. She was the first female board member of PepsiCo in history. I would just hug her and tell her what a wonderful person she was and all of her charity work and that fans today in 2023 still adore her and still want to know more about her. I echo all of that, but I would, uh, I would actually tell her something else. 
I would thank her for adopting your mom oh, and fantastic. Cindy because we got to meet you. You are so gracious. Thank you so much for that. Well, I've been so looking forward to this interview, Casey, because your grandmother is one of my all-time favorite actresses. On behalf of all the Joan Crawford fans out there, thank you so much for everything you're doing to celebrate and honor her legacy. I think she would be immensely proud of you and grateful to you. And, you know, a lot of your grandmother's story, now this is only my interpretation from reading many books, she felt unloved a lot of time in her life. And I think the love that you generate for her, that you radiate when you talk about her, somewhere out there, it's reaching her. And I want you to know how special you are. I appreciate that so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you and through you speaking with Jones fans all, all over the world. Thank you so much. Our guest has been Casey Lalonde, grandson of the legendary Joan Crawford. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my wonderful management team, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and my team at XPTV1 in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.